Do you feel a shiver up your spine from fear? Yes, it's another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind. Amp up your imagination and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. The Coffin Merchant by Richard Middleton Lunday on a November Sunday inspired Eustace Reynolds with a melancholy too insistent to be ignored and too causeless to be enjoyed. The gray sky overhead between the housetops, the cold wind round every street corner, the sad faces of the men and women on the pavements, combined to create an atmosphere of an eloquent misery. Eustace was sensitive to impressions, and in spite of a half-conscious effort to remain a dispassionate spectator of the world's melancholy, he felt the chill of the aimless day creeping over his spirit. Why was there no sun, no warmth, no laughter on the earth? What had become of all the children who kept laughter like a mask on the faces of disillusioned men? The wind blew down Southampton Street and chilled Eustace to a shiver that passed away in a shudder of disgust at the somber color of life. A windy Sunday in London before the lamps are lit tempts a man to believe in the nobility of work. At the corner by Charing Cross Telegraph Office, a man thrust a handbill under his eyes, but he shook his head impatiently. The blueness of the fingers that offered him the paper was alone sufficient to make him disinclined to remove his hands from his pocket, even for an instant. But the man would not be dismissed so lightly. "'Excuse me, sir,' he said, following him. "'You have not looked to see what my bills are. Whatever they are, I do not want them. That's where you are wrong, sir, the man said earnestly. You will never find life interesting if you do not lie in wait for the unexpected. As a matter of fact, I believe that my bill contains exactly what you do want. Eustace looked at the man with quick curiosity. His clothes were ragged, and the visible parts of his flesh were blue with cold, but his eyes were bright with intelligence and his speech was that of an educated man. It seemed to Eustace that he was being regarded with a keen expectancy, as though his decision on the trivial point was of real importance. "'I don't know what you are driving at,' he said, "'but if it will give you any pleasure, I will take one of your bills. Though, if you argue with all your clients, as you have with me, it must take you a long time to get rid of them.' "'I only offer them to suitable persons,' the man said." folding up one of the handbills while he spoke, and I'm sure you will not regret taking it. And he slipped the paper into Eustace's hand and walked rapidly away. Eustace looked after him curiously for a moment, and then opened the paper in his hand. When his eyes comprehended its significance, he gave a low whistle of astonishment. You will soon be wanting a coffin at Red. At 606 Great Inns Road, your order will be attended to with civility and dispatch. Call and see us. Eustace swung around quickly to look for the man, but he was out of sight. The wind was growing colder, and the lamps were beginning to shine out in the graying streets. Eustace crumpled the paper into his overcoat pocket and turned homewards. How silly, he said to himself, in conscious amusement. The sound of his footsteps on the pavement rang like an echo to his laugh. Part 2 Eustace was impressionable, but not temperamentally morbid, and he was troubled a little by the fact that the gruesomely bizarre handbill continued to recur to his mind. The thing was so manifestly absurd, he told himself with conviction that it was not worth a second thought. But this did not prevent him from thinking of it again and again. What manner of undertaker could hope to obtain business by giving away foolish handbills in the street? Really, the whole thing had the air of a brainless practical joke. Yet his intellectual fairness forced him to admit that as far as the man who had given him the bill was concerned, brainlessness was out of the question, and joking improbable. There had been depths in those little bright eyes, which his glance had not been able to sound, and the man's manner in making him accept the handbill had given the whole transaction a kind of ludicrous significance. You will soon be wanting a coffin, 
Eustace found himself turning the words over and over in his mind. If he had had any near relations, he might have construed the thing as an elaborate threat. But he was practically alone in the world, and it seemed to him that he was not likely to want a coffin for anyone but himself. Oh, damn the thing, he said impatiently, as he opened the door of his flat. It isn't worth worrying about. I mustn't let the whim of some mad tradesman get on my nerves. I've got no one to bury anyhow. Nevertheless, the thing lingered with him all the evening, and when his neighbor, the doctor, came in for a chat at ten o'clock, Eustace was glad to show him the strange handbill. The doctor, who had experienced the queer magics that are practiced to this day on the west coast of Africa, and who therefore had no nerves, was delighted with so striking an example of British commercial enterprise. Though, mind you, he added gravely, smoothing the crumpled paper on his knee, this sort of thing might do a lot of harm if it fell into the hands of a nervous subject. I should be inclined to punch the head of the ass who perpetrated it. Have you turned the address up in the post office directory? Eustace shook his head, and rose and fetched the fat red book which makes London an English city. To the gather they found the Gray's Inn Road, and ran their eyes down to number 606. Harding, G.J., Coffin Merchant and Undertaker. Not much information there, muttered the doctor. Coffin Merchant's a bit unusual, isn't it? queried Eustace. I suppose he manufactures coffins wholesale for the trade. Still, I didn't know they called themselves that. Anyhow, it seems as though that handbill is a genuine piece of downright foolishness. The idiot ought to be stopped advertising in that way. I'll go and see him myself tomorrow, said Eustace bluntly. Well, he's given you an invitation, said the doctor, so it's only polite of you to go. I'll drop in here in the evening to hear what he's like. I expect that you'll find him as mad as a hatter. Something like that, said Eustace, or he wouldn't give handbills to people like me. I've no one to bury except myself. No, said the doctor in the hall. I suppose you haven't. Don't let him measure you for a coffin, Reynolds. Eustace laughed. We never know, he said sententiously. Part 3 Next day was one of those gorgeous blue days of which November gives but few, and Eustace was glad to run out to Wimbledon for a game of golf, or rather for two. It was therefore dusk before he made his way to the Gray's Inn Road in search of the unexpected. His attitude towards his errand despite the doctor's laughter and the prosaic entry in the directory was a little confused. He could not help reflecting that, after all, the doctor had not seen a man with a little wise eyes, nor could he forget that Mr. G. J. Harding's description of himself as a coffin merchant, to say the least of it, approached the unusual. Yet he felt that it would be intolerable to chop the whole business without finding out what it all meant. On the whole, he would have preferred not to have discovered the riddle at all. But, having found it, he could not resist and go without an answer. Number 606 Gray's Inn Road was not like an ordinary undertaker's shop. The window was heavily draped with black cloth, but was otherwise unadorned. There were no letters from grateful mourners, no little model coffins, no photographs of marble memorials. Even more surprising was the absence of any name over the shop door, so that the uninformed stranger could not possibly tell what trade was carried on within, or who was responsible for the management of the business. This uncommercial modesty did not tend to remove Eustace's doubt as to the sanity of Mr. G. J. Harding but he opened the shop door, which started a large bell swinging noisily and stepped over the threshold. The shop was hardly more expressive inside than out. A broad counter ran across it, cutting it in two, and in the partial gloom overhead, a naked gas burner whistled a noisy song. Beyond this, the shop contained no furniture whatever, and no stock in trade except a few planks leaning against the wall in one corner. There was a large inkstand on the counter. Eustace waited patiently for a minute or two, and then, as no one came, he began stamping on the floor with his foot. This proved efficacious, for soon he heard the sound of footsteps ascending wooden stairs. The door behind the door opened, and a man came into the shop. He was dressed quite neatly now, and his hands were no longer blue with cold. But Eustace knew at once that it was the man who had given him the handbill. Nevertheless, he looked at Eustace without a sign of recognition. "'What can I do for you, sir?' he asked pleasantly. 
Eustace laid the handbill down on the counter. I want to know about this, he said. It strikes me as being in pretty bad taste, and if a nervous person got hold of it, it might be dangerous. You think so, sir? Yet our representative, he lingered affectionately on the words, our representative told you, I believe, that the handbill was only distributed to suitable cases. That's where you are wrong, said Eustace sharply, for I have no one to bury. Except yourself, said the merchant suavely. Eustace looked at him keenly. I don't see, he began, but the coffin merchant interrupted him. You must know, sir, he said, that this is no ordinary undertaker's business. We possess information that enables us to defy competition in our special class of trade. Information? Well, if you prefer it, you may say intuitions. If our representative handed you that advertisement, it was because he knew you would need it. Excuse me, said Eustace, you appear to be sane, but your words do not convey to me any reasonable significance. You gave me that foolish advertisement yourself, and now you say that you did so because you knew I would need it? I ask you why. The coffin merchant shrugged his shoulders. Ours is a sentimental trade, he said. I do not know why dead men want coffins, but they do. For my part, I would wish to be cremated. Dead men? Ah, I was coming to that. You see, Mr. Reynolds. Thank you. My name is Harding. G. J. Harding. You see, Mr. Reynolds, our intuitions are of a very special character. And if we say that you will need a coffin, it is probable that you will need one. You mean to say that I... Precisely. In 24 hours or less, Mr. Reynolds, you will need our services. The revelation of the coffin merchant's insanity came to Eustace with a certain relief. For the first time in the interview, he had a sense of the dark, empty shop and the whistling gas jet over his head. Why, it sounds like a threat, Mr. Harding, he said gaily. The coffin merchant looked at him oddly, produced a printed form from his pocket. If you would fill this up, he said. Eustace picked it up off the counter and laughed loud. It was an order for a hundred guinea funeral. I don't know what your game is, he said, but this has gone on long enough. Perhaps it has, Mr. Reynolds, said the coffin merchant, and he leant across the counter and looked Eustace straight in the face. For a moment Eustace was amused, then he was suddenly afraid. I think it's time I... He began slowly, and then he was silent his whole will intent on fighting the eyes of the coffin merchant. The song of the gas jet waned to a point in his ears and then rose steadily till it was like the beating of the world's heart. The eyes of the coffin merchant grew larger and larger till they blended in one great circle of fire. Then Eustace picked a pen off the counter and filled in the form. Thank you very much, Mr. Reynolds, said the coffin merchant, shaking hands with him politely. I can promise you every civility and dispatch. Good day, sir. Outside on the pavement, Eustace stood for a while trying to recall exactly what had happened. There was a slight scratch on his hand, and when he automatically touched it with his lips, it made them burn. The lit lamps in the Gray's Inn Road seemed to him a little unsteady, and the passerbys showed a disposition to blunder into him. Queer business, he said to himself dimly. I'd better have a cab. He reached home in a dream. It was nearly ten o'clock before the doctor remembered his promise and went upstairs to Eustace's flat. The outer door was half open, so that he thought he was expected, and he switched on the light in the little hall, and shut the door behind him with a simplicity of habit. But when he swung round from the door he gave a cry of astonishment. Eustace was lying asleep in a chair before him, with his face flushed and drooping on his shoulder, and his breath hissing noisily through his parted lips. The doctor looked at him quizzically. If I did not know you, my young friend, he remarked, I should say that you were as drunk as a lord. And he went up to Eustace and shook him by the shoulder. But Eustace did not wake. Queer, the doctor muttered, sniffing at Eustace's lips. He hasn't been drinking. The Corpse Light by Dick Donovan My name is John Patmore Lindsay. By profession, I'm a medical man and a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons, a member of the Royal College of Physicians, London. 
I'm also the author of numerous medical works, the best known perhaps being How to Keep in Good Health and Live Long. I was educated at one of the large public schools and took my degree at Oxford. I've generally been regarded as a hard-headed man and skeptical about all phenomena that were not capable of being explained by rational and known laws. Mysticism, occultism, spiritualism, and the like only served to excite my ridicule, and I entertained anything but a flattering opinion of those people who profess belief in such things. I was pleased to think it argued a weakness of mind. I referred to the few foregoing facts about myself because I wished to make it clear that I do not belong to that class of nervous and excitable people who fall prey to their own fancies, conjure up shapes and scenes out of their imaginings, and then vow and declare that they have been confronted with stern realities. What I am about to relate is so marvelous, so weird and startling, that I am fain to begin my story in a half-apologetic way. And even now, as I dwell upon it all, I wonder why, of all men, should I have been subjected to the unnatural and unearthly influence. But so it is. And though in a sense I am only half convinced, I no longer scoff. When somebody reminds me that there is more in heaven and earth than is dreamt of in our philosophy. But to my story. And when it was told a reader can judge for himself how powerful must have been the effect of what I witnessed. When it could induce a man of my mental fiber to commit to paper so astounding a narrative as the one I now pen. It is about twenty years ago that I took up a practice in the old-fashioned and picturesque little town of Brinton-on-Sea. At that time there was no railway into Brinton, the nearest station being some seven or eight miles away. The result was the town still retained a delightful old-time air, while the people were as primitive and old-fashioned as their town. Nevertheless, Brinton was far ahead of its neighbors, and though in a purely agricultural district, was enterprising and businesslike, while its weekly Tuesday market brought in enormous influx of the population of the district for miles around and very large sums of money changed hands. Being the chief town of the parish and boasting of a very curious and ancient church and a still more ancient market cross, to say nothing of several delightful old hostelries and a small though excellent museum of local curiosities consisting principally of Roman remains and fossils for which the district was renowned, it attracted not only the antiquary and the gourmand, but artists, tourists, and lovers of the picturesque, as well as those in search of quietude and repose. The nearest village was highly, about three miles away. Between the two places was a wide sweep of magnificent rolling downs, delightful at all times, but especially so in the summer. Many an ancient farmhouse was dotted about, with here and there a windmill. The down on the seaside terminated in a high headland from which a splendid lighthouse sent forth its warning beams over the fierce North Sea. Second only in conspicuousness to this lighthouse was an old and half-ruined windmill known all over the countryside as the Haunted Mill. When I first went to live in Brinton, this mill early attracted my attention, for it was one of the most picturesque old places of its kind I had ever seen, and as I had some artistic instincts, I could sketch with, as my two flattering friends said, no mean ability, the haunted mill appealed to me. It stood on rising ground close to the high road that ran between Brinton and Hyley. I gathered that there had been some dispute about the ownership, and, as is usually the case, the suckers of the harpies of the law had fastened upon it so to speak, and drained all its vitality, away after the manner of lawyers generally. The old-fashioned legal luminaries of the country were a slow-going set, and for over a quarter of a century that disputed claim had remained unsettled, and during that long period the old mill had been gradually falling into ruin. The foundations had from some cost sunk, throwing the main building out of the perpendicular. Part of the roof had fallen in, and the fierce gills of a quarter of a century had battered the sails pretty well to match wood. A long flight of wooden steps led up to the principal door, but these steps had rotted away in places, and the door itself had partly fallen inwards. Needless to say, this mill had become the home of bats and owls, and according to the yokels, 
of something more fearsome than either. It was a forlorn and mournful-looking place, anyway, even in the full blaze of sunshine. But seen in moonlight, its appearance was singularly weird, and well calculated to beget in the rustic mind a feeling of horror, and to produce a creepy and uncanny sensation in anyone susceptible to the influence of outre appearances. To me, it did not appeal in any of these aspects. I saw it only as a subject matter for an exceedingly effective picture, and yet I am bound to confess that even when transferred to border canvas there was a certain grim suggestiveness of things uncanny, and I easily understood how the superstitious and unreasoning rustic mind was awed into belief that this mouldering old mill was haunted by something more creepy and harrowing than bats and owls. Anyway, I heard wonderful tales at which I laughed, and when I learned that the country people generally gave the mill a wide berth at night, I blamed them for their stupidity. But it was in fact that worthy, and in other respects intelligent farmers and market folk, coming or going between Brinton and Hiley, after dark, preferred the much longer and dangerous route by the sea cliffs, even in the wildest weather. I have dwelt thus long on the haunted mill, because its bulks largely in my story, as will presently be seen, and I came in time to regard it with scarcely less awe than the rustics did. It was during the second year of my residence in Brinton that a young man named Charles Royce came home after having been absent at sea for three years. Royce's people occupied Gorse Hill Farm, about two miles to the south of Brinton. Young Charlie, a fine, handsome, but rather wild youngster, had, it appears, fallen desperately in love with Hanny Troutswell, who was a domestic in the employ of the rector of the parish. But Charlie's people did not approve of his choice, and thinking to cure him, packed him off to sea, and after an absence of three years and a month, the young fellow, bronze, tardy, more rollicking and handsome than ever, returned to his native village. I had known nothing of Charles Royce, or his story, up to the day of his return. But it chanced on that very day I had to pay a professional visit to the rectory, and the rector pressed me to lunch with him. Greatly interested in all his parishioners, and knowing something of the private history of most of the families in this district, the reverend gentleman, very naturally, fell into talking about young Royce, and he told me the story, adding, Hannah is a good girl, and I think it's rather a pity Charlie's people objected to his courting her. I believe she would have made him a capital wife. Has she given him up entirely, I asked. Oh, yes, and is engaged to Silas Hartrop, whose father owns the fishing smack, the North Sea Beauty. I've never had a very high opinion of Silas. I'm afraid he is a little too fond of skittles and beer. However, Hannah seems determined to have him in spite of anything I can say, so she must take her course, but I hope she will be able to reform him, and that the marriage will be a happy one. I really shouldn't be a bit surprised, however, if the girl took up with her old lover again, for I have no reason to know she was much attached to him. And I fancy Charlie, if we were so minded, could easily influence her to throw Silas overboard. This little story of love and disappointment naturally interested me, for in a country town the affairs of one's neighbors are a matter of greater moment than is the case in a big city. So it came to pass that a few weeks after Charlie's returned, it was pretty generally known that, even as the rector had suggested it might be, young Royce and pretty Hannah Troswell were spooning again, and Silas had virtually been told to go about his business. It was further known that Silas had taken his dismissal so much to heart that he had been seeking consolation in the beer pot. Of course, folk talk a good deal, and most of them sympathize with Silas and blamed Hannah. Very soon it began to be brooded about that Royce's people no longer opposed any objections to the wooing, and that in consequence Hannah and Charlie were to become husband and wife at Christmas. That was in about seven weeks' time. A month of the time had passed, and the askings were up in the parish church, when one day there went forth a rumor that Charles Royce was missing. Rumor took a more definite shape a few hours later, when it was positively stated that two nights previously Charles had left his father's house in high spirits and the best of health to visit Hannah and walk with her, as she was going into the town to make some purchases. 
On his way, he called at the Two Wagoners, a wayside inn, where he had a pint of beer and purchased an ounce of tobacco. From the time he left the inn, all trace of him was lost, and he was seen no more. Hannah waited his coming until long past the appointed hour, and when he failed to put in an appearance, she became angry and went off to the town by herself. Next day, her anger gave way to anxiety when she learned that he had left his home to visit her and had not since returned. And anxiety became alarm when two and three days slipped by without bringing any tidings of the truant. On the night that he left his home, the weather was very tempestuous and had been wild and stormy since. It was therefore suggested that on leaving the two wagoners, he might have got confused when he reached the common, which he had to cross to get to the rectory, and as there were several pools and treacherous hollows on the common, it was thought he had come to grief. But the most diligent search failed to justify the surmise. Such an event as this was well calculated to cause a sensation, not only in Brinton and its neighborhood, but throughout the county. Indeed, for many days it was a common topic of conversation, and at the Brinton weekly market the farmers and the rustics dwelt upon it to the exclusion of other things, and of course, everybody or nearly everybody had some wonderful theory of his or her own to account for the missing man's disappearance one old lady who every week for twenty years had trudged in from a village five miles off with poultry and eggs for the brinton market declared her belief that young royce had been spirited away and she recommended an appeal to a wondrous wise woman locally known as cracked mole but whose reputation for solving mysteries and discovering lost persons and things was very great. Ultimately, Royce's people did call in the services of its ancient fraud, but without any results. And despite wide publicity and every effort on the part of the rural and county police to say nothing of a hundred and one amateur detectives, the mystery remained unsolved. Charles Royce had apparently disappeared from off the face of the earth, leaving not a trace behind. In the process of times, the nine days' wonder gave place to something else, and excepting by those directly interested in him, Charles Royce was forgotten. Hannah took the matter very seriously to heart, and for a while lay dangerously ill. Silas Hartrop, who was much affected by his disappointment with regard to Hannah, went to the dogs, as the saying is, and drank so heavily that it ended in an attack of delirium tremens, it was called in to attend him and had hard work to pull him through. On his recovery, his father sent him to an uncle at Yarmouth, who was in the fishing trade, and soon afterwards news came that young Hartrop had been drowned at sea. He was out in the North Sea in his uncle's fishing smack, and though nobody saw him go, it was supposed that he fell overboard in the night. This set the local tongues wagging again for a time, but even the affairs of Brinton could not stand still because the near-do-wells Silas Hartrop was drowned. So sympathy was expressed with his people, and then the affair was dismissed. About two years later, I received an urgent message late one afternoon to hasten with all speed to High Lee to attend to the squire there, who had been taken suddenly, and as reportedly said, seriously ill. I had rather a heavy day of it, as there had been a good deal of sickness about for some time past, and it had taken me several hours to get through my list of patients. I just refreshed myself with a cup of tea and was about to enjoy a cigar when the messenger came, telling him to ride back as quickly as possible and say that I was coming. I busied myself with a few important matters which had to be attended to as I might be absent for some hours, and then I ordered my favorite mare princess to be saddled. I set off from Brinton soon after seven. It was a November night, bitterly cold, dark as Erebus while every now and then violent squalls swept the land from seaward. Princess knew the road well, so I gave the mare her head, and she went splendidly until we reached the ruined mill, when suddenly she wheeled around with such abruptness that though I was a good horseman, I was nearly pitched from the saddle. At the same moment, I was struck in the face by something that seemed cold and clammy. I thought at first it was a bat, but remembered that bats do not fly in November, an owl, but an owl would not have felt cold and clammy. However, I had little time for thought, as my attention had to be given to the mare. She seemed disposed to bolt and was trembling with fear. Then, to my intense astonishment, I noticed what seemed to be a large luminous body 
lying on the roadway. It had the appearance of a corpse, illuminated in some wonderful and mysterious manner. Had it not been for the fright of my mare, I should have thought I was a victim of some optical delusion. But Princess evidently saw the weird object and refused to pass it. So impressed was I with the idea that a real and substantial body was lying on the road, notwithstanding the strange unearthly light, that I slipped from the saddle, intending to investigate the matter, when suddenly it disappeared, and the cold and clammy something again struck me in the face. I confess that for the first time in my life I felt a strange, nervous, unaccountable fear. I say unaccountable because it would have been difficult for me to have given any explanation of my fear. Why, and of what was I afraid? Now, whatever the phenomenon was, there was the hard, stern fact to face that my horse had seen what I had seen and was terrified. There was something strangely uncanny about the whole business, and when a terrific squall, bringing with it sleet and rain, came howling from the sea, it seemed to emphasize the uncanniness, and the ruined mill, looming gaunt and grim in the darkness, caused me to shake with an involuntary shudder. The next moment I was trying to laugh myself out of my nervousness. Princess and I, I mentally argued, have been the victims of some atmospheric delusion. That was all very well. But the something cold and clammy that struck me in the face, and which may have struck the mare in the face also, was no atmospheric delusion. With a clarity I did not often display, I sprang into the saddle, spoke some encouraging words to the mare, for she was still trembling, and when she bounded forward and the haunted mill was behind me, I experienced a positive sense of relief. I found my patient at Hiley in a very bad way. He was suffering from an attack of apoplexy, and though I used all my skill on his behalf, he passed away towards midnight. His wife very kindly offered me a bed for the night, but as I had important matters to attend to early in the morning, I declined the hospitality, though I was thankful for a glass or two of generous port wine and some sandwiches. It was half past twelve when I left the house on my return journey. The incident by the haunted mill had been put out of my head by the case I had been called upon to attend. But as I mounted my mare, the groom, who had brought her round from the stable, said, It be a bad night, doctor, for riding, the kind of night when dead things come out of their graves. I laughed and replied, Tom, lad, I am surprised to hear you talk such rubbish. I thought you had more sense than that. Well, I tell you what, doctor, if I had to ride to Brinton tonight, I'd go by the cliffs and chance being drowned rather than pass yon old mill. These words for the moment unnerved me, and I honestly confess that I resolved to go by the cliffs, dangerous as the road was in the dark. Nevertheless, I laughed at Tom's fears and ridiculed him, though when I left the squire's grounds, I turned the mare's head towards the cliffs. In a few minutes, I was ridiculing myself. John Padmore Lindsay, I mentally exclaimed, you are a fool. All your life you have been ridiculing stories of the supernatural, and now... At your time of life, are you going to allow yourself to be frightened by a bogey? Shame on you. I bucked up, grew bold, and thereupon altered my course and got into the high road again. There had been a slight improvement in the weather. It had ceased to rain, but the wind had settled down into a steady gale and screeched and screamed over the moorland with a demonical fury. The darkness, however, was not so intense as it was, and a star here and there were visible through the torn clouds. But it was an eerie sort of night, and I was strangely impressed with a sense of my loneliness. It was absolutely unusual for me to feel like this, and I suggested to myself that my nerves were a little unstrung by overwork and the anxiety the squire's illness had caused me. And so I rode on, bowing my head to the storm while the mare stepped out well, and anticipating that in little more than half an hour I should be snug in bed. As we got abreast of the haunted mill, the mare once more gibbed, and all but threw me, and again I was struck in the face by the cold, clammy something. I have generally prided myself on being a bold man, but my boldness had evaporated now, and I almost think my hair rose on end as I observed that the illuminated corpse was lying in the roadway again, but now it appeared to be surrounded by a lake of blood. It was the most horrible, weird, marrow-curdling sight that ever human eyes looked upon. I tried to urge Princess forward, but she was stricken with terror and wheeling right round was setting off towards High Lee again. But once more I was struck in the face by the invisible something, and its coldness and clamminess made me shudder, 
while there in front of us lay the corpse in the pool of blood. The mare reared and plunged, but I got her head round, determining to make a wild gallop for Brinton and leave the horrors of the haunted mill behind. But the corpse was again in front of us, and I shrank back, almost appalled, as the something once more touched my face. I cannot hope to describe what my feelings were at this supreme moment. I don't believe anything human could have daunted me, but I was confronted by a supernatural mystery that not only terrified me, but the mare I was riding. Whichever way I turned, that awful ghastly object confronted me, and the blow in the face was repeated again and again. How long I endured the unutterable horrors of the situation, I really don't know. Possibly the time was measured by brief minutes. It seemed to me hours. At last my presence of mind returned. I dismounted and reasoned with myself that, whatever the apparition was, it had some import. I soothed the mare by patting her neck and talking to her, and I determined then to try and find a solution to the mystery. But now a more wondrous thing happened. The corpse, which was still made visibly by the unearthly light, rose straight up, and as it did so the blood seemed to flow away from it in great gurgling streams, for I solemnly declared that I distinctly heard gurgling sounds. The figure glided past me, and a sense of extraordinary coldness made me shiver. Slowly and gracefully, the shining corpse glided up the rotting steps of the old mill and disappeared through the doorway. No sooner had it gone than the mill itself seemed to glow with phosphorescent light and to become transparent, and I beheld a sight that took my breath away. I am disposed to think that for some moments my brain became so numb that insensibility ensued, for I am conscious of a blank. When the power of thought returned, I was still holding the brittle of the mare, and she was cropping the grass at her feet. The mill loomed blackly against the night sky, and it resumed its normal appearance again. The wind shrieked about it, the ragged scud raced through the heavens, and the air was filled with the sounds of the raging wind. At first I was inclined to doubt the evidence of my own senses. I tried to reason myself into belief that my imagination had played me a trick, but I didn't succeed although the mystery was too profound for my fathoming. So I mounted the mare, urged her to fastest pace, galloped into Brinton, and entered my house with a feeling of intense relief. Thoroughly exhausted by the prolonged physical and mental strain I had endured, I speedily sank into a deep, though troubled slumber, as soon as I got into bed. I was unusually late in rising the next day. I found that I had no appetite for breakfast. Indeed, I felt ill and out of sorts, and though I busied myself with my professional duties, I was haunted by the strange incidents of the preceding night. Never before in the whole course of my career had I been so impressed, so unnerved, and so dispirited. I wanted to believe that I was still as skeptical as ever, but it was no use. What I had seen might have been unearthly, but I had seen it, and it was no use trying to argue myself out of that fact. The result was in the course of the afternoon I called on my old friend, Mr. Goodyear, who was the chief constable. He was a strong-minded man, and like myself, a hardened skeptic about all things that smacked of the supernatural. Goodyear, I said, I'm out of sorts, and I want you to humor a strange fancy I have. Bring one of your best men and come with me to the haunted mill, but first let me exact from you a pledge of honor that if our journey should result in nothing, you will keep the matter secret, as I am very sensitive to ridicule. He looked at me in amazement, and then, as he burst into a hearty laugh, he exclaimed, I say, my friend, you are overworking yourself. It's time you got a locum tenens, and took a holiday. I told him that I agreed with him, nevertheless. I begged him to humor me, and accompany me to the mill. At last he reluctantly consented to do so, and an hour later we drove out of town in my dog-cart. There were four of us, as I took Peter, my groom, with me. We had provided ourselves with lanterns, but Goodyear's man and Peter knew nothing of the subject of our journey. When we got abreast of the mill, I drew up, and giving the reins to Peter, I alighted, and Goodyear did the same. Taking him on one side, I said, I have had a vision, and unless I am the victim of incipient madness, we shall find a dead body in the mill. The light of the dog-cart was shining full in his face, and I saw the expression of alarm that my words brought. Look here, old chap, he said in a cheery, kindly way, as he put his arm through mine. You are not going into that mill, but straight home again. Come now, get into the cart, 
and don't let's have any more of this nonsense. I felt disposed to yield to him, and I actually placed my foot on the step to mount when I staggered back and exclaimed, My God, am I going mad or is this a reality? Once again, I had been struck in the face by the cold, clammy something, and I saw Goodyear suddenly clap his face with his hand as he cried out, Hello? What the deuce is that? Aha! I exclaimed exultantly, for I no longer thought my brain was giving way. You have felt it too? Well, something cold and nasty like struck me in the face. A bat, I expect. Confound him. Bats don't fly at this time of the year, I replied. By Jove, no more they do. I approached him, and he said in a low no. Good year. This is a mystery beyond our solving. I am really resolved to go into that mill. He was a brave man. For a moment or two he hesitated. But on my insistence he consented to humor me, and so we lit the lantern, and leaving the groom in charge of the horse and trap, I, Goodyear, and his man, made our way with difficulty up the rotting steps, which were slimy and sodden with wet. As we entered the mill, an extraordinary scene of desolation and ruin met our gaze as we flashed the light of the lantern about. In places the floor had broken away, leaving yawning chasms of blackness. From the moldering rafters, huge festoons of cobwebs hung. The accumulated dust and dampness of years had given them the appearance of cords. And, oh, how the wind moaned eerily through the rifts and crannies and broken windows. If ever there was a place on this earth where evil spirits might dwell, it was surely that ghoul-haunted old mill. The startling aspect of the place impressed us all, perhaps me more than the other two. We advanced gingerly, for the floor was so rotten we were afraid it would crumble beneath our feet. My companions were a little bewildered, I think, and were evidently at a loss to know what we had come there for. But some strange feeling impelled me to seek for something, though if I had been asked to define that something, for the life of me I could not have done it. Forward I went, however, taking the lead and holding the lantern above my head so that its rays might fall afar. But they revealed nothing save the rotting floor and slimy walls. A ladder led to the upper story, and I expressed my intention of mounting it. Goodyear tried to dissuade me, but I was resolute and led the way. The ladder was so creaky and fragile that it was not safe for more than one to be on it at a time. When I reached the second floor and drew myself up through the trap, I am absolutely certain I heard a sigh. You may say it was the wind. I swear it was not. The wind was moaning drearily enough, but the sigh was a distinctive note and unmistakable. As I turned the lantern round, so that it might light every hole and corner of the place, I noticed what seemed to be a sackful of something lying in a corner. I approached and touched it with my foot, and drew back in alarm, for touch and sound told me it contained neither corn nor chafe. I waited until my companions had joined me. Then I said to Goodyear, Unless I am mistaken, there is something dreadful in that sack. He stooped and placed his hand on the sack, and I saw him start back. In another moment, he recovered himself, and whipping out his knife, cut the string which fastened up the mouth of the sack, and revealed a human skull, with the hair and shriveled mummified flesh still adhering to it. Great heavens, he exclaimed, here is a human body. We held a hurried conversation, and decided to leave the ghastly thing undisturbed until the morrow. So we scuttled down as fast as we could and went home. I did not return to the mill again myself. My part had been played. Investigation made it absolutely certain that the moldering remains were those of poor Charlie Royce, and it was no less absolutely certain that he had been foully murdered. For not only was there a bullet hole in the skull and a bullet inside, but his throat had been cut. It was murder, horrible and damnable. The verdict of the coroner's jury pronounced it murder, but there was no evidence to prove who had done the deed. Circumstances, however, pointed to Charlie's rival, Silas Hartrop. Was it a guilty conscience that drove him to drink? And did the Furies who avenged such deeds impel him on that dark and stormy night in the North Sea to end the torture of his accursed earthly life? Who can tell? The sea holds its secrets, and not a scrap of legal evidence can be obtained. But though the law declined the responsibility of fixing the guilt of the dark deed on Silas, there was a consensus of opinion 
that he was the guilty party. It was a mystery, but the greatest mystery of all was that I, the skeptic, should have been selected by some supernatural power to be the instrument for bringing the foul crime to light. For myself, I attempt no explanation. I have told a true story. Let those who can explain it. I admit now that there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in our philosophy.